let's prepare our hearts to uh, worship the living God and to, uh, to help us do that. Uh, we're going to hear from our musicians a uh, meditation. Good morning. Please rise if you're able for the call to worship. O oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless his name. Tell of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all the peoples. Friends, let's sing together this morning from our red hymnals, number 38. Immortal, invisible, God only wise. Lord God, we're certainly aware that our worship this morning is something that you've called us to in your word. As we answer that call, it's very much our pleasure to do so. We endeavor, hopefully, with an earnest and sincere effort to live as you call us to live and to worship as you call us to worship. So align us, we pray, with the purpose for which you designed us. Align us ever more in harmony with our Lord Jesus, and help us to have a sincere reverence in this worship, that it would be authentic in our expression of love for you, our Father. In Christ's name we pray, amen.
The ten words that God's given to us to live by, you know, friends, are not just merely some list of rules. And I think a lot of people would look at these things and, uh, and say, well, yes, I, I do these or I endeavor to do them. The rich young ruler had said that to Jesus when he came to Jesus and said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? I, I think we need to look deeper. You know, the, the problems that we have oftentimes loom large. And God seems to recede and look small. And these words are really a call for us to understand who God is and who we are. You think of the things he tells us. I'm the Lord your God. You'll have no other gods before me. You'll not make for yourself an idol in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You won't bow down to them or worship them. And I think a lot of people would say, well, I've got no danger of that. I'm not going to carve an idol and bow down to, but what is an idol? It's the place where we go besides God to look for salvation, to look for fulfillment. Um, That might be a job, or it might be school, or it might be a relationship, it might be any number of things. We're told not to misuse the name of the Lord your God, and there are some people who would be Uh, Very careful not to use the name of God as an exclamation or Christ as a swear word. That's good. But that's not merely what this is talking about. It's talking about when we invoke the name of God to bless things that he doesn't bless. Or perhaps just simply invoke the name of God carelessly, not living according to his will. We're told to observe the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Jesus told us that man was not made for the Sabbath, but the Sabbath was made for man. Uh, You can't go 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You need rest. God designed you and created you that way. You know, sometimes what we do is we substitute different busyness or other distractions for actual rest. And then we're told to do things like honor father and mother, uh, not to murder, which doesn't have to do only with uh, physically taking someone's life, but not caring about their well-being because we're too focused on ourselves. To not commit adultery, to not steal, to not give false testimony, to not covet anything that your neighbor has. And all of these things that God's told us about are not just, as I said, a list of rules, but they tell us something about who God is and who he's created us to be and how we're to respond to him. And because we didn't respond to him well, God sent his son into the world to redeem us, to bring us back to God. And through his son, through Jesus Christ, let's go to the Father and seek his grace. Praying the prayer of confession together. Father, I come to you by the one who descended to the lowest parts of the earth, and then ascended far above the heavens so that he might fill all things. Help me today to know the love of Christ, which surpasses knowledge, and to be filled with all the fullness of God. My sorrows and temptations loom large and make you look small. Correct my vision that I may see your immensity, which overspills all bounds. And knowing that Christ has delivered me from the condition of sin, help me to put away my sins to glorify you through Christ my Lord. Take a few moments to seek God, to seek his face, to seek his grace in Jesus Christ.
Nehemiah knew God, and because he did, it prompted him to pray in a certain way. How much more can we pray this prayer through Jesus Christ? Nehemiah said, you are a forgiving God, gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love. Therefore, you will not desert your people. And thank God for his grace to us. For our responsive reading this morning, we'll be reading Psalm 29, as written in the hymnal, in, in the bulletin, rather. Psalm 29. Ascribe to the Lord, O mighty ones. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory and his name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. The voice of the Lord is over the waters. The God of glory thunders. The Lord thunders over the mighty waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is majestic. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. The Lord breaks in pieces the cedars of Lebanon. He makes Lebanon skip like a calf, skip like a wild The voice of the Lord strikes with flashes of lightning. The voice of the Lord twists the oaks and strips the forests bare. And in his temple all cry for glory. The Lord sits enthroned over the flood. The Lord is enthroned as king forever. The Lord gives strength to his people. The Lord blesses his people with peace. Amen. As we prepare to render his tithes and our offerings. I'd like to read briefly from 1 Chronicles 29, and the free will offerings here that are mentioned are specifically for the uh, building of the temple to give a little context. Then the leaders of fathers' houses made their free will offerings, and did also the leaders of the tribes, the commanders of thousands and of hundreds, and the officers of the king's work. They gave for the service of the house of God 5,000 talents and 10,000 derricks of gold, 10,000 talents of silver, 18,000 talents of bronze, and 100,000 talents of iron. And whoever had precious stones gave them to the treasury of the house of the Lord in care of Jehiel the Gershonite. Then the people rejoiced because they had given willingly, for with a whole heart they had offered freely to the Lord. David the king also rejoiced greatly. While we will freely offer our tithes and our offerings either online or in the receptacles at the back of the sanctuary, let's take some time to consider how we can give ourselves over completely to the Lord, as David says, with a whole heart.
pray. Father, whether our tithes and offerings are materially abundant, as were the free will offerings of gold and the precious materials in the preceding passage from Chronicles, or whether they look more like the widow's offerings of her two small copper coins, giving, as Jesus said, out of her poverty, out of all that she had to live on. In any event, let us give freely and with a whole heart, because our hearts, our material wealth, and our very lives are absolutely yours. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. This morning we'll be confessing our faith using the Apostles' Creed, and I think it's, it's tempting at times because we do this every week for us to recite this um, a bit out of habit and not really think about the import of the words that we're saying. And when you, you look at these phrases, each of these phrases really is really incredible when you think about it. The maker of heaven and earth, this, this God who created everything around us, this is something that is very incredible to those who don't have our faith. When you think about this God who, who came down to earth and was crucified, died and was buried, what, what that means, what the import of that, that he created this holy Catholic church that we are a part of. Again, each of these statements is, is really something that is amazing, incredible. It really speaks to the greatness of God and to the love of God. And so as we recite this this morning, I would encourage you to really think about what we're saying. This isn't just a, a series of facts, a list of facts that we recite, although it is that. It's something much more. It really demonstrates who it is that we serve. So I ask you, fellow believers, what is it that you believe? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Let us now go before our God in prayer. Father in heaven, we come before you this morning glorifying you as the sovereign Lord. As we sang only a few minutes ago, you are immortal, invisible. You are most blessed, most glorious. You have no beginning, for you are the ancient of days. And in power you have no equal. You are almighty, victorious. Father, though we can repeat these appellations and though we know in faith that they are true, we confess that we can never truly comprehend your full greatness. For our imaginations fail us when we try, when we use merely our physical faculties and experiences. We see this so clearly where man has tried. For among the ancients, with their so-called gods, we see the frailties of man imprinted, their smallness and pettiness, their lack of justice and love. And as enlightened man jettisoned these ancient gods, he replaced them with something even smaller, man himself lift up as the ultimate being, despite his so evident failings and weaknesses. Father, as we come before you this morning, we ask that you would help us to profess and to glorify you as God, as the God you have revealed yourself to be in the Bible and through your creation, that our understanding and glorification of you would not be clouded by our society's worldview. For you are indeed sovereign, controlling all the events in our lives and in this world. You are omnipotent, with unlimited power for nothing no one, not even death itself, can affect your good plan. And you are both truly just and truly loving, 
so much so that you redeemed us for yourself at the cost of your Son. As your Apostle Peter instructed, this morning we humble ourselves under your mighty hand so that at the proper time you may exalt us. We cast all our anxieties on you because you care for us. Father, this morning we first lift up our dear sister Laura as she is grieving the loss of her husband. We thank you that John's passing was peaceful and at home as was their wish, but we know that this loss of a spouse, especially of one who was by her side for so long, will leave a deep void in her heart. Comfort Laura right now and give her peace. Strengthen her faith in your promise that you are the resurrection and the life. And help us as her church family to support her during the days and weeks and months ahead. As we pray about loss, Father, we continue to lift up the Hammond family as well, that you would comfort each of their hearts in this time of grief. We pray for healing for a number of family members of those in this congregation who are dealing with arm or back or heart or other health-related issues. In each one of these cases, we ask for physical healing and where the family member does not know you for spiritual restoration as well. We continue to pray also for Mark at our sister congregation who is struggling with cancer. And as we pray for healing, we thank you for granting our request for Brian's brothers and for Jean's sister. We pray for wisdom for those in our congregation who are making school or work-related decisions that they would know how to use their time and talents for your kingdom. For our community, we thank you for the good resolution of the concerns of some of the physical neighbors in this area that the plans to develop this area can progress. We continue to pray that these plans would result in a spiritual harvest for your kingdom. We pray as well for those with civil authority, like Matt Letourneau of the Loudoun County Board of Supervisors, that they would have wisdom as they carry out their responsibilities. Father, we pray as well that your kingdom would expand. As we have opportunities to have conversations with friends and with neighbors, bless our words and use them to point more to you. Within this congregation, we thank you for Jean's faithful service in maintaining our website and making it a resource for those in need. Continue to bless this work we ask and use it to spread the good news. For our missionaries, we pray for Matthew and Lois in Pasadena, California, that you would bless the church plant there with more believers and be with Isaac as well as he ministers in that community. Further abroad in Uganda, we ask for comfort for the family and friends and students of Opie, one of the teachers in that community. We also ask that you would help Charles have a successful surgery and rapid healing, that he would be able to soon return to his students at Knox Theological College in Mambale. Father, as we bring all these requests before you, we confess that they seem so daunting in our eyes. And yet, as we read in your word, we realize that this is only because we have an insufficient appreciation for your greatness. For as your servant Isaiah wrote, Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. And so, Father, we lay these requests at your throne, knowing in faith that you both have the power to answer them, and that you and your love will bring about your good plan. For we ask each one of these in the name of your Son, Jesus, praying as he has taught us. Our Father in heaven, holy is your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now if you are able, let's rise. And as we prepare to hear God's word, we'll sing Almighty and Changeable God. Um, it's in the black hymnal number nine. Thank you. 
Continuing our study and consideration uh, about heaven. And as we do that, it's important to lay a foundation for what the Bible says about heaven. Because there's a lot of misapprehensions and uh, mis yeah, misapprehensions, I would say, about it. But, you know, they'll tell us today uh, that the problem in our society is that there's no place for God, right? Have you heard that? People will complain. There's no place for God. Actually, our great problem is that we believe there is a place for God. And the great, the foundational, the indispensable understanding of anything that this book has to tell us starts at the beginning with the understanding that there's no place for God. And until we understand that, we're always going to misunderstand heaven. So let's begin at the beginning. I'm going to read from Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. In the beginning... God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. Our God, today as we worship you, fill us with your Holy Spirit and give us by that spirit and by your word a view of your great grandeur. For only, Lord, in knowing who you are, may we know who we are and what our destiny is. Grant us these things, we pray, through Christ our Lord. Amen. These two short verses sum up the great and indispensable doctrine of creation that is summed up in the creedal statement that we recited today. I believe in God the Father Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth. When we uh, recite the Nicene Creed, it adds, of all things visible and invisible. And many people today, I think, miss the importance of the opening statement of this book because they're not aware of the context into which it was given. You know, this weekend is Memorial Day, and there'll be various Memorial Day celebrations around the towns, and oftentimes uh, there'll be young people uh, reciting uh, portions of speeches from our history, and it's not uncommon uh, at these celebrations to hear some young person begin the speech which begins four score and seven years ago our forefathers brought forth on this continent a new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal and of course probably everybody here recognizes that as the start of the Gettysburg Address right if somebody was not from our country, if English was not their first language, uh, if, they, um, if they didn't really know the history of our country, or when this was given, they could probably get a sense of what this is referring to. But there'd be certain things that they wouldn't know. You see, you understand what this means because you have some knowledge that you're not even aware of that you have, for example, somebody who's not a native English speaker and who doesn't know the history of the English language will not know that a score is 20 years. So they won't know what that means, four score and seven years ago. Right, and um, you know the author and deliverer of this speech was Abraham Lincoln. You know the occasion of it. They wouldn't know that. And lastly, you know the genre of this, that this is a speech, the speech uh, made on a particular occasion. It's not, it's not a work of mathematics, even though it uses numbers four score and seven years ago. It's not a history lesson, although it refers to history. But it's a speech. And if you didn't 
know those things, you'd understand the words, I think, well enough, but you might miss the point of them, the real import of them. The opening two verses of Genesis are so familiar to us that we skip over them. We want to get to the rest of it, to the, to the important stuff, to the good stuff. Right? But the real point of what is said is found in these two first verses. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, the earth was formless and empty, and darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the first hearers of this would say, aha, this is a creation story. We've heard these before. We know what this is. And creation stories were common in the world into which this one was given. And many of the creation stories of the ancient Near East are remarkably similar to this one. In fact, it's probably why people would recognize it so readily to be a creation story. In all the ancient Near Eastern creation stories, we read of an identical setting. There's chaos and there's a primordial sea. And so we read here, darkness was on the face of the deep and the Spirit of God hovered over the waters. That statement would provide no shock for people hearing it. There'd be nothing new there. It would garner no attention. They'd say, we know that. We've heard those things before. That earth and sky were formed from this watery chaos was a storyline they were familiar with. That later sun and moon came out of this chaos would have elicited from them an, of course, the startling statement is in Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In the 8th century BC, a, a little bit after this creation account was written, a fellow by the name of uh, Hesiod, a Greek poet, wrote something called Theogony. Uh, theogony literally means the origin of the gods. And if you read Theogony, you'll read about the world beginning with a, a spontaneous, uncreated chaos from which came forth Gaia, Earth, and then the abyss, and then the desire, and then everything else followed. Or just previous to the writing of this account, about 1900 BC, uh, the Babylonian Enuma Elish, which was written in Akkadian cuneiform, tells of an eternal, formless, and void, watery chaos, out of which emerged the gods Apsu and Tiamat, and from them everything else came. In the creation stories of Egypt, where uh, the people coming out of, the Israelites coming out of there uh, after 400 years, and right after that when this was written, starts with a watery chaos, which brings forth a mound. And on that mound, the god Atom creates himself, and then other things. But the setting is all similar, this watery chaos. And we could make a movie of all of the creation narratives of the ancient world if, you know, if there was cinematography back then. We could make a movie of them and they'd all look remarkably the same. But the movie about Genesis would have to begin differently. A movie of all the other creation narratives would start with the footage opening, the first picture being the raging, chaotic sea. But to depict the Genesis account, in the beginning, there could be only words printed on the screen. It's the only way we'd be able to understand what we were seeing. And those words would say, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And only then could the picture open of the raging, 
chaotic sea. In Genesis, all created things have a place. They come from somewhere, they belong somewhere, they're contained by something. So the sea, as we go on to read, the sea brings forth creatures. And they live within the sea, that's their environment. The sky exists before the birds. We're told that the earth brings forth animals, that's their environment, that's where they belong. The first human being is created from the dust of the earth. But there's no place for God. God does not come from anywhere. He simply is. And the startling thing about Genesis for its first readers is this notion that God is transcendent which is simply to say that he is before, above, outside of, and beyond everything else. God does not come from the watery chaos. And so we say, I believe in God the Father Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth. You know, uh, linguists will tell you that that phrase, heaven and earth, is something called a merism. It means to take two things at opposite extremes to indicate everything in between. In the beginning, we could paraphrase it, God created everything that there is. He's the maker of all things, visible and invisible. There's nothing that God has not made, and there's an implication to that that is, therefore, there's nothing that God does not have a claim on. There's nothing that God has not made, therefore, there's nothing that God does not have a claim on. We look at mankind. Mankind is of the earth, from the earth, contained by the earth, listen very carefully here, but God is not of heaven, from the heaven, contained by the heaven. In the beginning, God created the heavens. And so what we see here is that there are two great realities. There's God, there's everything else. Not God and heaven and everything else. Not God and the angels and everything else. Not God and the spiritual realm and everything else. There is God and there's everything else. And somebody might ask, you know, well, if if God was not in heaven when he was created, then where was God? before he created. And if you understand what Genesis is telling you here, you'll understand that that question is a meaningless question. To ask where was God? There was no where for God. There was nothing but God. God is the only one, the only thing that simply is. God was no where, he simply is. And so there are these two great realities, God and everything else, but they're not equal realities. God is first, he's necessary, and he's the wholly independent reality, and everything else is the derivative, the contingent, the wholly dependent reality. Consequently, Heaven is not God's necessary habitat, like the sea is a fish's necessary habitat, like the earth is an animal or man's necessary habitat, like heaven is the angel's necessary habitat. Heaven is the place where God determines to meet his creation. Heaven is not God's intrinsic dwelling place, but his chosen meeting place. And it's important that you get that firmly fixed in your mind. God is in no way a part of his creation. His creation, 
All of it, heaven and earth, was made by him. It was not made out of some previous stuff. Uh, God didn't create it out of himself as though God were the stuff. But the creation was, in the words of the old theologians, creatio ex nihilo, creation out of nothing. In the 18th century, a philosophy known as deism became popular. And uh, deism taught that God created the universe kind of like a clockmaker would make a clock, and then he sets it up on a mantle and he watches it run. And appreciates his handiwork, but he doesn't really have any interaction with it, except for from time to time, perhaps, to wind it or to clean it or something like that, but, but really no necessary interaction. And that is not how the Bible teaches God interacts with his creation. But God could have interacted with his creation in that way. God has absolutely no obligation to be involved with his creation. Heaven was created as the intersection point between God and his creation. God is infinite, eternal, and unchangeable. Heaven is not infinite, it's not eternal, and it's not unchangeable. Heaven's not infinite. It has boundaries. It has limits. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That means that there's some things that are not heaven and some things that are not earth. It's not infinite. And it's not eternal. In the beginning, God created the heavens. It didn't always exist. And heaven is not, as we shall see in the coming weeks, unchangeable. So God, let me say it again, God does not live in heaven like the angels live in heaven or like we live on the earth. And you know, Solomon realized the implications of this brief statement here, I believe, Uh, when he built the temple and he dedicated it to God, listen to his prayer in 1 Kings 8, 27. He said, but will God really dwell on earth? The heavens, even the highest heavens, cannot contain you. Heaven is not the necessary dwelling place of God that contains him like the earth contains us, like the sea contains the fish. There is no place for God. He simply is. There's an implication to that. The implication is this. That God is in heaven. Listen carefully to this. That God is in heaven means that God humbles himself to be there. God condescends to be in heaven. Let that sink in for a moment, because until you realize that, you've had too small of thoughts of God. God condescends, he humbles himself to be in heaven. Heaven is not God's necessary habitat. Heaven is the place where God's chosen to meet his creation. God humbles himself to be in heaven. When we began this study a few weeks ago, I mentioned that so many ideas of Western culture and even um, ideas of, of Western Christianity, popularly so, about heaven, have been unduly influenced by the Greek philosopher Plato. Let me just say here that you cannot arrive at heaven if you start with heaven at least not the heaven that we find in the Bible. To arrive at heaven as we find it in the Bible, you need to start with God. The creation of heaven, you'll note here, it's just very brief. It's in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. We find 
from elsewhere in Scripture that there is an order here, that the heavens were created first. And in uh, Job chapter 38, as God speaks to Job, Job laments uh, his situation and uh, tacitly questions God's wisdom. God says to Job, Job, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who marked off its dimensions? Surely you know. Who stretched a measuring line across it? On what were its footings set? Or who laid its cornerstone while the morning stars sang together and all the angels shouted for joy? And so you've got this scene of the angels witnessing the terrestrial creation, the creation of the earth. And so God meets with his non terrestrial or, or non-earthly creatures in heaven, God condescends and humbles himself to be in heaven. But it's odd, isn't it? Human beings, not angels, are said to be made in the image of God. It's never said anywhere that angels are made in the image of God. God condescends to dwell in heaven, but he never becomes a part of that heavenly creation. And here's the strange wonder. Heaven is the meeting place of God. God condescends to live there, never in any sense becomes a part of it. But in Christ, God condescends further to earth and though he never became a part of his heavenly creation, in Christ he did become a part of his earthly creation. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. This one was in the beginning with God. All things came into existence through him. John says, I want to be clear about this. Apart from him, not one thing came into existence that has come into existence. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. The writer to the Hebrews, making it clear as well, says, since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity, for surely it is not angels he helps but Abraham's descendants and those who believe. Heaven is not God's necessary habitat. Heaven is the chosen place of God to meet his creation. And yet human beings made in the image of God were not created in heaven, but on earth. They were not created for heaven. They were created for earth. Over the next week, I just want you to take some time to let that sink in. Because it's foundational for what, for some of you perhaps, will prove a radical reorientation for what you think heaven is and what it's all about. What the scriptures tell us about our origin and destiny will only make sense if we get the foundation right. It's important that you fix in your mind that there's no place for God. God created the heavens and the earth. He created all there is. Heaven is not God's natural habitat. Heaven is God's chosen place to meet his creation. And in Christ, God has become a very part of this creation. If we're to understand heaven and what it's all about, you foundationally need to understand that there is no place for God. He is before all things. And living in heaven is not for God necessary, it's a condescension. 
You need to understand that heaven was created as the meeting place between God and his creation. You need to understand that human beings were not created in heaven, and heaven is not our habitat. And you need to understand that in Christ, God became a part, didn't merely condescend to, but became a part of the earthly creation. Let's pray. Our Father, I pray that you would fill us with a vision of uh, your grandeur. As we see that grandeur, that that would become a firm foundation for what your book teaches us about heaven. The destiny uh, for which you have made us and redeemed us and to which you call us. We pray, Father, I pray that you would make us obedient to that call through Christ our Lord. Amen. As we conclude our worship this morning, let me invite you, if you're able, to uh, rise and we'll sing together, Great God, how infinite art thou. some, uh, some um, uh, food and uh, the fellowship. And it looks like the rain's held off. I think it was supposed to rain today, but the rain's held off. So, uh, so the kids will be able to play on the, uh, on the tick-free playground. Right, you got that at the beginning, right? It's been tick-treated. Thank you, Mr. Wilson. Now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.